Today, Census Bureau Director Kenneth Pruitt met with the House panel to discuss preparations for this year's population count. Among the topics discussed, recruiting employees to help with the census. It's an hour and 25 minutes. Good morning. A quorum being present. The member and proceed then to the uh, director Pruitt. For almost two years, the subcommittee has been actively involved in the oversight of the 2000 census. The subcommittee has held hearings on a wide range of subjects, such as minority outreach and the local census updated since addresses. The ranking member Ms. Maloney and I have held field hearings in Miami, Phoenix, and Racine, Wisconsin. We have visited inner city schools and Indian reservations. We have been to numerous schools and visited with children to talk about the importance of being counted in the upcoming census. This Congress followed through and has to give the Census Bureau the resources it requested to conduct a full and accurate census. In fact, the $1.7 billion additional funding requested by the uh, 2000 census for since 2000 fiscal year was approved this past fall. Today we are here and the census has at long last begun. Today's hearings will be one in a series to be held during the upcoming months where Congress will have the opportunity to get regular updates from the Bureau on the status of the 2000 census. Where are things going well? Where are problems? And what can Congress do to help? Once again, this committee has before it Census Bureau Director Dr. Kenneth Pruitt. In December, Dr. Pruitt was kind enough to come to my district and join me in census outreach efforts. It was an excellent visit. We spent time in a local high school, spoke to an assembly full of grade schoolers, and met with the local community leaders. As Dr. Pruitt can attest, the interest in the census is high. This past Sunday, there was a front page article in my local hometown newspaper, The Braden and Herald. The front page says, census groups reach out to area minorities, which is exactly the job that we're, the Census Bureau should be doing. And the, it talks about a complete out committee meeting at Holy Cross Catholic Church in Palmetto, uh, where the complete out committee and census people were involved in uh, reaching out to the Hispanic community. And they said approximately 70, mostly Hispanics, were in attendance. Uh, the Reverend Nicanor Lobato, who is a priest at Holy Catholic uh, Cross Catholic Church, where they have 1,000 Hispanics, a total of 4,300 parishioners, said, let me just quote a couple of things. Quote, is the, the, the priest's talk, he says, don't be afraid to answer. Don't be afraid to get involved. Those without immigration papers, they are afraid. And I think they're wrong to be afraid, but the reality they, is they are. Lobato said census officials convinced him that federal immigration officials, taxing authorities, and other government agencies have no access to personal census data. Quote the priest, if I knew or even was suspicious that it would be bad for you Hispanic people, I would not be involved and would not allow them to use the parish hall, end quote. That's exactly the type of effort we need to reach out to the undercounted populations. They have, I see a fair coming up on February 19th at a Title I school, Tillman Elementary School. Um, they're gonna be at Walmart Supercenter uh, where the road, the van's gonna be showing up on February 27th and uh, at a, uh, another community fair on March 18th. Uh, and this is only one of 550 census offices, but it's nice to see that we're making front page of the paper, getting the, the word out, and that the local offices are working. Director Pruitt last month traveled to Alaska to officially enumerate the first person in the 2000 census. Arriving in the Bering Sea fishing village of Unalakik via dog sled, photograph that will go down in uh, history. Uh, <laughs> Director Pruitt counted 82-year-old Stanton Kachatag and his wife in their one-story cedar frame house. Not only do the native people of Alaska represent a difficult population to account because of the extreme weather and remote locations, Alaska in 1990 had the nation's lowest male response rate of 52%. Of course, we are hopeful that the $102 million ad campaign will help the response rates rise. I'm sure virtually everyone in this room has seen or heard at least one census ad. Many of us saw the ad that aired during the Super Bowl. I also understand that there is an upcoming shift in the focus of the ad campaign and hope to hear more about it. Local outreach efforts combined with the 90 plus 5 campaign where local governments are being asked to increase their 1990 male response rates by 5% leave us hopeful that we can break the downward spiral of male response rates that we have been experiencing for the past three decades. I know that the announcement letters went out last month. How is that program being received by the 39,000 governments nationwide? Another great task is the massive employment effort that is currently underway. Hundreds of thousands of enumerators must be hired and trained for an applicant pool from an applicant pool of a, some three million people. I recently read a news account that the Navajo Reservation near Window Rock, Arizona, the Bureau is having trouble filling the nearly 1,500 census jobs despite high unemployment and a $10 hourly wage. There are reports out of 
Tulacqua, Oklahoma, that the 14 county region of the Cherokee Nation has only received half of the applications needed. Also disturbing was a comment by the Cherokee chief, Chad Smith, who said that some tribal members see no reason to cooperate with the U.S. government. The largest percentage on account 1990 was the, among the Native American population, and nowhere is trust more of an issue than on reservations. I'm very interested in how the Bureau is working to overcome these issues. I've also heard, read reports that there are employment problems in Kentucky where nearly half the counties don't have enough enumerators. Many of these areas are rural or non-city style addresses and thus are subject to either update leave or list enumerate procedures. Are these rural areas nationwide or just in isolated and what bureau do you believe? Much of the success of this census hinges on the mortality rate. It is, is of course necessary to prepare a worst case scenario. What if the anticipated male response rate is not 61% but lower? It will not be sufficient for the Bureau to come before Congress and simply ask for more money. The members of this body, and rightfully so, will want to know exactly how the money is to be spent, as well as what went wrong with the original plans. I hope that today that Director Pruitt can shed some light on what contingency plans the Bureau has and give us a sense of where we stand just seven weeks from Census Day. As you are aware, Director Pruitt, in your invitation letter, you were asked to be prepared to comment on other areas, including providing an overview of where we are in the Bureau's operational timeline, as well as what key activities and dates lay ahead. What is the status of the Bureau's address listing program and new construction listing program? How is the data capture system, which retrieves information for millions of census forms, holding up under testing? How is the staffing and operation of the local census offices proceeding? I look forward to your testimony, Dr. Pruitt, and thank you for appearing in the subcommittee. Ms. Maloney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and welcome, Dr. Pruitt, and I, I compliment you on your, your dedication and, and commitment. My entire? Going all the way to Alaska via dog sled to remote areas. I, I think that's a, a great testimony of, of your commitment to, to, to making sure that we contact as many people as possible. I, I'm glad that we're, we're having uh, this hearing today, and I, I really want to thank the Chairman for agreeing to my request to have it. It is important that as the Census Bureau begins reviewing for full-scale operations, Congress and the American public stay informed on the progress of the largest peacetime mobilization ever, the United States Census Civic Ceremony. And from reading your testimony, Dr. Pruitt, it appears that the 2000 census operations are, are on schedule and on budget. Things seem to be going according to plan. Recruiting is on track, if not ahead of schedule. 520 local census offices are open and operational. There should be one in each congressional district. The paid advertising campaign is moving smoothly into its most active phase, and the address list is nearly complete. I, I must say I was thrilled, as the chairman mentioned, when we saw the ad on, on, the, on the Super Bowl and uh, I had received from Dr. Pruitt's office a huge book that has a listing of when the advertisements are going to be on the air so that members of Congress can let their constituents know, let the groups that are working with them know, so that they can be watching and, and getting the word out. Uh, considering the, the voices of gloom and doom that were prevalent a year ago, I think we can all take pride in the excellent work of the career professionals at the Census Bureau. Thank you very much. Additionally, we in Congress should be pleased that we were able to produce in the best bipartisan manner 4.5 billion. The Bureau told us that they needed um, amidst a tremendously complicated uh, budget scenario. In spite of all the good tidings for the Census, there is nothing we or the Census Bureau can do to prevent complications that probably will arise. Of course, there are going to be problems. You cannot conduct an operation of this scale without some problems. Hiring over half of a million people, training these half of a million people, and sending them out into the field is a daunting task. I know today we will hear from Director Pruitt the hiring process is on track, but what if, for example, the, the mailback response rate is less than we expect? Or, or what if the economy doing so well, the Bureau cannot find enough workers to conduct the census? Let me be
be clear, I do not think these things will happen. I believe that this census will be one of the best in our nation's history. Did you hear that, Dr. Pruitt? <laughs> and I am confident that the extensive planning the Census Bureau has done over the last decade will pay off. But, but that does not mean that we should not prepare, prepare for all contingencies, as the GAO has suggested. I have introduced legislation, H.R. 3581, to create a contingency fund for the 2000 Census. If there, if there are problems with the mail response rate or with the hiring program, funds need to be available to respond to glitches fast so that the larger job can be done on time. Following on recommendations from the GAO report, my bill would also expand the labor pool for specific groups of people, including active drug military personnel, active duty military personnel, and individuals who have received buyouts from the federal government. Lastly, it would allow recipients of federal assistance to work for the census without a loss of benefits. This is a great idea, one that was originally included in a bill that my friend and colleague, Carrie Meek, uh, uh, introduced. This bill has been reported out of the Government Reform Committee with the chairman's support. These are common sense preventatives to ensure a good census. As I've said, Mr. Chairman, I am happy to learn that every timetable and task for the 2000 census is currently on track. I look forward to hearing the details of the many uh, census operations from our, our esteemed witness, uh, the Honorable Kenneth Pruitt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. That's Davis, it. would you? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I'll make a few uh, comments. And given the fact that this is the beginning of the new millennium, and it's also the first time that we've come together, I, I simply want to indicate how much pleasure I got from working with both you and the ranking member in the old millennium. I look forward to uh, what we're going to do in this one. So, Mr. Chairman, let me commend you for calling this hearing to examine the status of operations for the 2000 Census. Likewise, I'd also like to thank Dr. Pruitt and the Census Bureau for his not only being here today, but for the tremendous work that they've done getting us to this point. As we rapidly prepare for the 2000 Census, the largest peacetime mobilization, it is important that we continue to examine the status of key operations. In addition to examining the status of these operations, it is also important that community leaders at every level get fully involved. I'm pleased to note that my own full count committee in Chicago has been actively engaged in raising the awareness of the importance of participation in the 2000 census. Also last week, I joined with Mayor Daley and other community leaders in my district to underscore how critical the census is in determining services, programs, and representation. That particular community was seriously undercounted in the 1990 census. Our charge with our increased technology and understanding of the past is to ensure that we get better <coughs> and better and better at conducting this important activity. The Census Bureau's commitment to a $102 million paid advertising campaign is in fact working and is serving to heighten awareness of the 2000 Census. There were, of course, the advertisements that all of you who watch Super Bowls, ads, and on radio, ads in magazines and newspapers, and I've seen the ads on billboards. This commitment to advertisement in rural and urban communities could serve the goal of greater participation of the 2000 census. Ultimately, greater participation will require the trust of the people to return those forms and to answer the call of census enumerators. I also would like to take this opportunity to commend my city, the city of Chicago, for the tremendous effort that has been put forth by city government to raise awareness and the comprehensive program that has been put together under the leadership of Mayor Daley. I also want to commend the Chicago media, both its uh, print and electronic. I've 
seen editorials in the Chicago Sun-Times, in the Chicago Tribune, in the Chicago Daily Defender, alerting people to the fact that there is nothing to fear and that in all likelihood Franklin Delano Roosevelt could be quoted when he said that the only thing that they have to fear would in fact be fear itself. But that this data, this information cannot be used, will not be used, has not been used for any purpose other than to count the people. So I look forward to the testimony of Dr. Pruitt and certainly know that he's going to shed some additional light on those challenges which are ahead. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and yield back for the rest of the time. Dr. Pruitt has his testimony on that. If you, we'll go ahead and get sworn in. I believe you're going to have with you is uh, Mr. Waite, Mr. Raines, Ms. Marks, and Mr. Dukes. Ms. Dukes, y'all want to come forward in case they're needed, they can be sworn in and be easier to uh, just by that time you can come up or just raise your right hand and swear after me. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Let the record show they all uh, answer in the affirmative. Um, Director Pruitt. Your opening statement, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mrs. Maloney, uh, Mr. Davis. And I do want to begin by thanking you for your leadership in establishing uh, the bipartisan congressional support for the census effort. Uh, the partnership with Congress um, has uh, taken off in quite impressive ways. And that partnership does send a strong message across America that all of us have to be united in the goal of achieving a complete and accurate census. Indeed, since this partnership was launched, members of Congress have really taken on the challenge of promoting the census. Local town hall meetings, public service announcements, local census uh, grand openings, and publicizing uh, census jobs. Uh, and obviously, uh, uh, rather heavy use of your own congressional newsletters. What I will do in these oral remarks is to quickly and therefore necessarily superficially offer a broad overview of current progress. My written testimony attempts to cover specific issues raised in your invitation letter in more depth. The major message is that since 2000 is on track, is on schedule. Were this not so, I would be bringing it to your attention. There is no doubt in my mind that we, will, that we will need the full support of Congress, particularly of this committee, were we to foresee or encounter any major threats to a successful census. Since I reported to you last fall, the actual enumeration for census 2000 has begun. We have produced a master address file containing approximately 120 million addresses, have printed the questionnaires that will go to each of these addresses, have opened up all 520 local census offices, are intentionally promoting the census, and actively seeking to hire the army of workers we will need to do the job. As we speak, census takers are systematically canvassing the remote areas of Alaska to complete a questionnaire for each housing unit and its inhabitants. And as was referenced, I did have the honor of conducting the first enumeration in Unakalit, Alaska, a village on the Bering Sea, about 400 miles northwest of Anchorage. Uh, I do want to put for the, into the record that I was under the supervision of a team leader because I was considered a trainee. Um, and I, I would tell you that uh, I was quite moved. Uh, after I finished that first uh, uh, enumeration, the first one in, 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 the, in the nation, uh, for the first one in the millennium, if you will, that I had a lump in my throat, and I felt very proud to uh, have, have initiated what we know will be, I think, a very major successful census. Indeed, if the warm welcome that we received in Unicolit, including whale blubber, uh, for which some of us did acquire a taste, uh, it is an acquired taste, um, if that warm welcome can be replicated throughout this country, we will indeed have a successful census. What Unicolit means uh, is the wind that blows from the east. Uh, or blows to the east, excuse me. And what we tried to signal uh, with that successful enumeration, we've now counted 100% of that village, is to try to send a signal across the country that if we can do 100% uh, in a remote village on the edge of the Bering Sea, we should be able to do 100% in the rest of the country. Why are we already counting the people in uh, remote Alaska? Because travel is easier now than it will be when the spring thaws make the villages inaccessible. And many Alaska natives who congregate in their villages in winter will have dispersed uh, to fish and hunt. This is just one of the many examples where the Census Bureau has crafted procedures to meet very specific enumeration challenges. 
The next big field operation begins March 3rd. Census enumerators will deliver questionnaires to some 20 million housing units in the update leave areas of the country. These areas are those with different address types, mostly in small towns and rural areas where the address systems have less geographic structure. Census enumerators, in addition to leaving a questionnaire at each house, will also check for any missing addresses. This is what we mean by the update part. We update our address file. And of course, householders are expected to mail back the form in the postage paid envelope. Then beginning March 13th, continuing through March 15th, the U.S. Postal Service will deliver questionnaires to some 96 million addresses in the mail out mail back areas of the country. These are areas where the housing units have city style addresses, such as 101 Main Street. These addresses are mostly in major urban centers, but also in many small and mid-sized towns and some rural areas. As in update leave areas, householders are expected to return the mail. Also beginning March 13th and continuing through March and April, census enumerators will visit slightly less than a million housing units in list enumerate areas, similar to remote Alaska, but where an early start was not dictated by special conditions. These are remote rural areas or areas with significant seasonal resident populations where it is not efficient to compile a pre-census address list. At the time census enumerators visit these housing units, they will also list the unit and complete the questionnaire. Thus, there is no separate non-response follow-up for these areas because indeed we will have their, their information. Obviously, for housing units not returning the census form, currently estimated at approximately 46 million, we will send enumerators in the non-response follow-up operation. This operation is scheduled to begin April 27 and will continue for 10 weeks until the 1st of July. That 10-week period is, of course, an average. Some our areas will require less time and some more. Let me turn quickly to marketing. Through our marketing program, we are aggressively seeking to encourage response to the census so that we can keep the non-response workload as small as possible. We began our paid advertising campaign last November, placing ads to educate people about the importance and potential benefits of the census. We have now entered the second phase of our paid advertising campaign designed to motivate response with the message, this is your future, don't leave it blank. During the months of February and March, Census 2000 will be among the top two or three advertisers in the nation. Ads will appear on every television network and on cable television, radio, magazine, newspapers, billboards, subways, buses, and so on. Overall, the Census 2000 advertising campaign will comprise some 250 different creative elements and more than 130,000 individual media placements. Paid advertising is just one piece of the Census Bureau's integrated marketing strategy for Census 2000. The other pieces include partnership, uh, the uh, uh, package that includes the advance letter, questionnaire, and thank you reminder postcards, media relations, promotions, and special events, many of which have already been referenced in your opening comments. Each of these pieces has its own strengths, and by working in concert, we hope will reach and motivate everyone to participate in the census. Of these, partnership is perhaps the most important. We already have some 55,000 partnership agreements and complete count committees in state, local, and tribal governments, businesses, national, and community-based organizations. Educators have ordered over 800,000 teaching kits for use in our Census in Schools initiative. Next week, 12 recre recreational ve vehicles, one in each census region, will set out across the country to promote Census 2000. We have a very high-profile launch event planned for next Tuesday, February the 15th. Each of these vehicles will be equipped with exhibits, videos, printed information, and other giveaways to spread the message that Census 2000 is on the way. This road tour is designed to generate media attention in various markets, from small towns to large cities, and enhance the efforts of our partnership and media specialists. Uh, finally, um, as the chairman has referenced, we have launched an initiative to encourage grassroots participation in every town, city, county, state, and tribal area in the nation. We are providing the highest elected official as well as members of Congress with toolkits that include sample news releases, articles, talking points, and other written materials, a dedicated website to enable participants to obtain, obtain updated information and download promotional materials, and a toll-free number to allow elected officials to call for additional information. In this campaign, we are challenging communities to increase their overall response rates in Census 2000 by at least five percentage points over their 1990 level. This component, called 90 plus 5, is setting a public target for mailback of 70 percent nationwide. That is a 5 percent increase in the 1990 base. To draw maximum public attention to this effort, mailback response rates for each jurisdiction will be posted on the Internet and otherwise made public and updated daily from March 27 to April 11. 
It will then be followed by a second component, because you count, which is aimed at increasing cooperation with census enumerators, enumerators when they come knocking on doors. We are making every effort to convert the census into a civic event of the highest order. We are gratified by the enthusiastic, even exuberant involvement in the census by so many partners in local governments. I might note, however, that many of the promotional events are independently planned and managed. They are not, even indirectly, under the control of the Census Bureau. It is likely that the exuberance at times will generate events or materials that might receive less than positive public response. I hope that this committee will appreciate that not every news story or letter from a constituent about the Census will be describing something that the Census Bureau itself is responsible for. Turn quickly then to hiring. Clearly, one of the key challenges to a successful census is our ability to recruit hundreds of thousands of short-term, part-time workers in an exceptionally tight labor market. Hiring is progressing well, and at this time, we have no reason to believe that we will be unable to reach our goals. We have met hiring goals for every operation thus far, and in early January, we launched a blitz to hire 500,000 temporary census workers to fill the 860,000 jobs we will need in 2000 most of which will be for non-response follow-up. We believe we will need to test 3 million individuals for these jobs, about six per position, because of anticipated turnover, applicants who fail background checks, and so forth. More specifically, we want to have a qualified applicant pool of 2.4 million individuals. Our goal, of course, is to hire local pe people who are familiar with their communities. So far, we've recruited nearly 1.2 million qualified applicants, half of the total needed and slightly ahead of our target for February 1st. April 19th is our target date for the applicant pool of 2.4 million. To keep on target with recruitment goals, we're using paid advertising on television, radio, print ads, and on buses. We've also established a job information site on the internet. In one recent week, we had over 400,000 calls to our telephone job line and nearly 700,000 hits on our internet recruitment site. So there is great, and we believe, growing interest in census jobs. We are partnering with a number of organizations to help us achieve our goal. I will mention just two under a grant from the Department of Labor. Goodwill Industries is working to identify welfare to work participants who are qualified for census jobs and is using its retail stores to distribute recruiting information to individuals who are not in the welfare to work program. We are also partnering with a, partnering with a corporation, corporation for National Service, <coughs> which has 30,000 partner agencies with more than 700,000 volunteers in its three programs, and they are assisting us in our recruitment efforts. Uh, then, sir, I want to make quick reference to our contractors. As part of this progress report, I want to remind the committee that a significant percentage of our budget is contracted out to private industry for the paid advertising campaign, of course, but also for data capture, telephone assistance centers, network operations, electronic data dissemination, and other key operations. These technological contracts add up to approximately $1 billion. Yesterday, we convened senior officials from Lockheed Martin, TRW, Unisys, IBM, and other contractors. Each company reported on its progress to date. The uniform message is that they are ready to go. More than that, these senior officials publicly expressed their pride at being associated with Census 2000 and their individual and collective commitment to work non-competitively in this endeavor and, in fact, to go the extra mile. Mr. Chairman, I conclude these opening remarks with a pledge under oath to this committee. The Census Bureau is now engaged in a massive, complex effort, one that the GAO has described and, as you all have referenced, as the largest peacetime mobilization in the nation's history. Literally hundreds and hundreds of individual operations are already underway, and every Census Bureau employee responsible for some part of Census 2000 is fully engaged. At the same time, this committee the General Accounting Office, the Congressional Monitoring Board, and other units of government must fulfill their appropriate oversight functions. I very much appreciate that in discharging this committee's oversight responsibilities, you, Mr. Chairman, have taken into account that the census is underway and that we are fully engaged. I also report to you that I met a few days ago with senior officers of the GAO, and we jointly agreed that the principle that should guide GAO oversight at this stage is constructive engagement the phrase that was introduced by Nancy Kingsbury, Assistant Controller General. I have written the co-chairs of the Congressional Monitoring Board asking for a meeting to review how best to ensure that its considerable oversight activities are conducted in a manner compatible with the intense operational pressures we now face. 
my pledge to you and to other oversight agencies is that we will bring to your attention quickly any operational crisis that could put the census at risk. Obviously, in an effort of this complexity and enormity, there will be dozens of small-scale problems every day. I could give you examples of today's issues. The ones of last week have been solved. The ones of next week are not yet known to us. My pledge is not to try to inform you of each and every one of these small-scale issues, but to take seriously my responsibility to inform you if we foresee or encounter a problem that could put the census at risk. As of today, the important word is that no such threat is in view since the 2000 is on track and on schedule. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Director Pruitt. Um, it is exciting to know that the first people in this country have been counted, and so uh, the process is gonna go very quickly over these next few months. Let me clarify a couple things uh, on dates. Um, the initially, there'll be a, for the people who are going to be responding by mail, a card will go in the mail to, let, to advise people a census form is on the way, correct? The first week of March, yes, sir. That's the first week in March. And then, the, I said, the 13th or so, the forms will actually go in the mail. Yes, uh, the post office is scheduled to mail between the 13th and 15th of March. It's a huge undertaking for the post office, so you have to work closely with them to prepare for that type of system. And then, another card, a reminder card, will go in the mail during the last week of March. Okay. And these have been, you know, the design of these cards are, you know, the, the ad, you know, Young and Ruben Cam or somebody's helping Yes, sir, they've been, uh, they've been researched. There's uh, a little color to them or something. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, right. good, good. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, on that particular issue, not too much color, uh, we're very eager to make sure that these don't look like junk mail. Okay. And so we did good. subject them to a lot of testing to try okay. to make them look very official. Okay, right, that, I mean, th that's the right. idea is that we, right. you know. Yeah. Uh, now, <clears throat> The, your, when do you start doing the non-response follow-up? When the forms come in, they go into four different distribution centers, and they're scanned. The envelopes will have a barcode on them, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that's how you can very quickly tell that day. It's all automated um, to know the response rate. Uh, correct. All that is hopeless. being, um, uh, when the envelopes come in, they're immediately scanned to the address. Uh, we're not yet... Uh, uh, scanning the questionnaire itself, only right. the fact that the envelope has come in, the barcoded envelope has come in. And that barcode on the envelope will tell the address of yes. the person. Okay, yes. that will be fed in. So we will know. Then the non-response follow-up will begin when? Give me the, uh, April date. 17th. April uh, 17th until, for 10 weeks, until? Uh, early July. Early basically. July. Um, now, how do you close out? Would you explain how close out will work you know, on this non-response follow-up, I mean, they, you know, they'll go knock on the door and knock on the door, and I mean, how does that work? Yes, uh, our, our uh, basic rule is that we try to make uh, six contacts per household, uh, three person and three by phone. Uh, we get the phone uh, numbers as best we can uh, by either using, obviously, uh, phone books, other systems, or by asking a neighbor and so forth. So we, we do have a three visit and three phone call uh, limit. After that, we believe we're not likely to find the person. How uh, long a period of time will that be over? Will well, that, be? that it, it, uh, our rules call that those uh, those visits and phone calls have to be made at different times of the day and different days of the week. So that if you try to find the person on a Wednesday afternoon, then you should go back the next time on a Saturday morning, uh, the next time on a Sunday night, and so forth. And that will be spread across. Of course, you've got an enumerator with a with a stack of, of, of non-response follow-up um, uh, households to visit. And they will be doing these uh, uh, during this period of time. Um, they will then report back to their crew leaders, of course, uh, when they they when they no longer believe that they're able to kind of reach one of those households. Uh, we we obviously we're in a, in a in a bind at all times in this. We're trying to save the taxpayer money. Every time we send a numerator to a household, we pay their transportation costs, we pay their uh, hourly cost, and if we have reason to believe that after six efforts so we're not likely to get a response, then we won't send them out an eighth, ninth, tenth time. Uh, just it wouldn't be a prudent use of, the, of, of our resources. Then what? Then what after we don't have any response? We then, um, we do have what we call closeout close out procedures uh, where possibly we go to proxy interviews, uh, which is to say we ask a neighbor or someone who might have reason to know who is in that whole, does someone live in that housing unit? 
Uh, can you give us a rough estimate or uh, uh, as best you can about the composition of that household? And then we'll record that as a, as a response. And it's tagged in the file as a proxy response. Is this any different from 1990? No, no. Um, the, the, the time of, for these six contacts, I mean, if someone's on vacation, like you know, the latter part of Easter's late this year and people are gone on holiday vacations sure. for a week or two. So there'll be a time oh, to spread it out. Yes, so sir. Yes, time. sir. Spread across. Right. And again, uh, using neighbors often, uh, right. saying, look, we knocked on the door uh, of somebody down the street and nobody seems to be home. And they say, well, that's because they're, they're gone for two weeks. Then fine, we wait two weeks, we tag that, and we wouldn't come back for two weeks. So yeah. it's spread across a fairly extensive period of time. Could you comment some more on this contingency plan? I know in your statement you said you'll come back to Congress, which of course. Well, uh, that's uh, right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know you. But uh, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, um, right. yeah, you can interpret that. And I know the uh, yeah. there are all kinds of contingencies from yes. the uh, 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 the individual areas may have a you know a low response rate or, or the nationwide. I mean, the response right. rate is fifty one percent. You know, we got a crisis, obviously. Yes, sir. So yeah. could you give me some more well, explanation about the contingency? We have a large number of contingency operations for all kinds of a uh, activities, and we can talk about those specifically. What happens if we lose a local office? What happens if, we, if something happens in a data capture center? We have numerous, numerous contingencies built into all kinds of our operations, uh, technological uh, uh, backup systems, uh, uh, capacity to move people quickly from if an office, something happens to an office, we would actually be able to reduplicate that office quickly in another office. So we have a lot of those kind of contingency plans, but I think you're specifically addressing, of course, the question of the mail back response Yeah, let's, let's talk about that. Um, That's the could I spend a few moments uh, explaining the 61%? And that may help us understand the contingencies that we have to put in place. After 1990, when the, um, when the initial mail back response rate came in at uh, 65%, down to, down to 10%, as you know, from the previous decade, the early work of the Census Bureau uh, looking at uh, the pattern of response, responses to other kinds of surveys, the changing demography in the country, and so forth, led us to an estimate as low as 55%. Uh, if you'd gone back to Census Bureau documents in the, in the immediate period after 1990, most of the conversation would have been, we have got to anticipate the possibility of a mailback response rate as low as 55% in 2000. The Census Bureau then uh, engaged in a number of experiments. Um, the experiments included what would happen if you could make the form more user-friendly. The 1990 form is a FOSDIC-based form, uh, which was also a technological in innovation by the Census Bureau. They fill in the circle so it could be data scanned. Well, you, when you're doing a FOSDIC form, you have to have much more complicated <coughs> instructions. So when you look at it, you can open it up and you say, this is just too hard. I'm just not going to do it. Now, we don't know how many people out there actually don't do the census form because they, they, they're intimidated by it. But we do know that once we designed a more user-friendly form, and you've seen the form, of course, it's, it's very readable, uh, it's simple questions, you just write it in and so forth. All of that, of course, was based upon the fact that we could do optical scanning uh, recognition. We had a higher quality of technology to do the data scanning in 2000, so we could design a form where instead of putting in a 4 and a 7 in two little FOSDIC circles, you could simply write in 47. It also made it a more, a more uh, attractive uh, format. So that's one experiment. We obviously uh, looked into the whole issue of multiple languages, and we did take the questionnaire up to six languages, as you know, and as we've testified before. Um, we also went to three mailings instead of one mailing. Another thing we did in 2000 that we had not done in 1990, we make it more prominent on the envelope that this is required by law. Uh, that was another experiment. So we did a series of experiments. And on the basis, and it, let me be completely candid with you, I mean, not to remind, so you won't have to remind me. Uh, one of those experiments was also the second mailing experiment. Um, the setting aside for a moment the second mailing experiment, the other experiments all led us to move from 55 to 61 percent as our estimate. So that's the, the basis of it. it, it it's, it's, it's rooted in some experience with uh, trusting different kinds of procedures, mailing procedures, form procedures, and so forth. Got us to 61 percent. The important thing is that the 61 percent, because the Census Bureau is a, is a data-driven organization, it doesn't like to estimate the behavior of the American population or doesn't have evidence, the 61 percent does not take into account the impact of the advertising campaign or the promotional effort. Because we have no experience to tell you, to sit here and tell the U.S. Congress that will increase it by 3 or 4 or 5 percent. We just don't know. Um, 
Obviously, the fact that we've gone public with uh, the Plus Five campaign uh, is based upon our increasing confidence that we will do better than the 61 percent. But we only have evidence to predict a 61 percent response rate. That's a long answer, a prefatory answer, but I wanted you to know that 61 percent wasn't just kind of pulled out of the hat. It was based upon demographic modeling, modeling of response rates, attention to what will happen if you change the form this way, if you send out three mailings instead of just the one mailing, if you use first class instead of third class, uh, and so forth. Now, what is our contingency plan if it's below 61%? There are two big concerns. There are actually a lot of big ones, but, but I'll just talk about the two biggest ones. <laughs> Yeah. I've gone well past my five minutes, but yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. I think the rest of the committee yeah. is too. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Two right. big concerns, obviously, at this stage. One is the can we recruit enough people to do the job, and the other is the response rate. And those two concerns interact. Obviously, if, if we do extremely well with our recruitment pool and the response rate slips a little bit, we still have enough people to go out and do the job. Or if we don't do so well in our recruitment, but our response rate is slightly higher, then we're not as anxious about the fact that we only have 1.8 or 2 million people in our applicant pool and not 2.4. Those two things are very tightly linked. Then there is a third big component, which is the budget. Obviously, we budgeted at 61 percent in that, that, that labor pool. So if the, uh, re if the response rate were to dip much below 61 percent, 60 percent, 59 percent, we've got enough flexibility that we think we could, we could re recover from that. 57 percent, 56 percent, we're very anxious, and we're not sure we've got the flexibility and the capacity to recover. Now, what is our contingency for that? And I'm not trying to be evasive. It, it depends almost entirely on what's happened to our recruitment pool, because at that point, we're behind in our recruitment, as well as having a lower response rate. We actually have a crisis, uh, and we have nothing to say to you as a contingency other than we will have to go out and probably increase the wage rate. That would be one way we would increase the labor pool, uh, and that would obviously cost more money. Uh, we obviously would have to expend, uh, perhaps extend the time that we're in the field, because if we've got to go out and find, let us use extremes. If, if it's a 40% response rate, we, we can't do non-response follow-up in, in 10 weeks, in all likelihood, uh, unless we hired uh, you know, 3 million people instead of 500,000 people. And even then, the management of that would be probably not something that we want to try to do. So the, the contingency plan has got to be, if there's a serious sliding of that response rate, it's got to be figured out in terms of the size of the recruitment pool you've got in place. And if it's insufficient, there's nothing that we can put in place. We can put in a contingency for losing an office. We can put in a contingency for losing a data capture center. We can put in a contingency for address uh, mailback problems. We can put in a contingency for lots of things, but there's really no thing that you can do if you're really looking at, at a, a, a 55 or 50 percent response rate when we expect it to be 61, short of sort of rebuilding the census, which is what we would have to do. Just if I, since I know this is important, I'll just go on with one other, one other sentence on this. Um, the important thing is we will know as early as April 1 or 2 whether we will need a hearing on April 12th, <laughs> which is our, our date for uh, beginning to cut for, non, for non-response follow-up. That is, our internal models tell us at what rate we expect to get responses. And for the most part, the American people respond to something like this if they're going to quickly, and then it begins to taper off. And there's no reason to presume that you're going to get, a, if you haven't gotten them by April 1st, you're going to get a few more scattered out all the way up into May, but you're not going to get big hunks uh, later on in the period, and that we know from lots of experience. So the important thing is that we will know early, uh, that is, a good two weeks before when we have to actually begin to put in our non-response follow-up process into place. And, uh, and therefore, we would, when I say come back and talk to Congress, I mean that fairly seriously. <laughs> uh, it's not just a throwaway line. Um, but the important thing is that by the time we actually had a hearing, let us, I invent that today, but on April 12th, we would have come in with very clean plans and with a budget that would be required to sort of get us out of this hole, which we would have found ourselves in. Sorry for that long. As you know, uh, you know, the Congress has responded with you know, supplementals in the past, and we stand prepared to move as quickly as necessary. 
Uh, but uh, you know, it's encouraging that 61% is kind of the lower end of your expectations, we hope. And uh, because one time you were projecting, I think, 67 percent, and it dropped. And I, you know, but that right, and that was the second mailing question. All right. 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 Uh, Ms. Maloney. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, to follow up on some of the chairman's questions, do you have examples of your three mailers with you that are going to be going out no. on the census? You don't? <laughs> Sorry. You don't? Could you, could you send it to oh, us so we yes. could? Could um, we ta have a look at it? I'd just like to see them. And, and maybe it'd be good to have them as part of the record, so we just have it as part of the official record. Yes, sorry. I, I, I'd like to uh, turn to the transparency issue. Uh, Dr. Pruitt, you have spoken before about the unprecedented level of scrutiny the 2000 census is receiving from various oversight groups. Everyone from this subcommittee to the Census Monitoring Board to the National Academy of Sciences and the Secretary of Commerce is the advisory committee is involved. In fact, I understand the National Academy recently had another meeting to review the Bureau's planned statistical design. In, in many respects, this will be the most uh, transparent census uh, our nation has ever had. Would you please outline the, the major events which have occurred in this regard uh, since we met uh, with you last fall, and is there another group that's reviewing you that I didn't mention, and, and just the entire uh, transparency oversight issue, if you would elaborate, add to it, and give us more information on it. Yes. Uh, well, I do think the, um, the GAO reports that have emerged since last fall have been a major part of this. I think that, uh, as this committee uh, requested, the GAO did do a thorough review of the, uh, re the uh, revised budget, uh, the $1.7 billion and asking the, the, the understandable question of making certain that this was, uh, this 1.7 was associated with new procedures that we had to put in place because of the Supreme Court uh, ruling. Uh, and I think the GAO report did, did confirm that. It was a very, very intensive analysis of, of, our, um, of our budgeting and of our operations. Uh, there was also, of course, the GAO report on the uh, LUCA program. Uh, there is now, a, most recently, there's one on the uh, data capture. So I would say that uh, in terms of the oversight activities, uh, the JO has certainly done the most uh, so sophisticated and sustained uh, research and, and, and investigation. The Inspector General's Office, of course, has also conducted, uh, when appropriate, its own uh, independent investigations. It did one on the um, advertising campaign uh, to make it certain that this money was well spent, uh, was appropriately <laughs> spent. Uh, we got very good marks from that uh, review. The monitoring board has issued a number of reports, uh, uh, sometimes independently from the presidential and congressional side, I guess I would say mostly independently. Uh, the one that was joint was on the advertising campaign. That was also very favorable. Uh, the monitoring board, the congressional side of the monitoring board just issued one on the undercount issue, and I haven't um, actually just got that this morning. Uh, I, I read drafts of it, but I can't give you in detail what they're saying. So the, the um, and of course, we've had hearings with this committee, uh, and we do have a number of advisory committees, some uh, six or seven of them that do meet quarterly. That means we have one meeting almost all of the time. Um, so we're, we do think that we have been uh, enormously responsive to the understandable interest of this country in, in how well Census 2000 has been planned. Uh, I think the most important thing I can say, um, uh, Mrs. Maloney, about the, the review that's taken place since, um, since then, and I, I don't mean to, to judge my uh, my judges harshly, but mainly the message is that uh, things are kind of on track and on schedule, but there are still risks. Uh, now, they don't necessarily say what to do about them other than this is a big complicated op operation and therefore something could go wrong. Well, and including that we could have a lower than, than anticipated response rate or we could have trouble with recruitment. Uh, we understand those risks. Uh, we are doing everything we can to kind of compensate for them. So I would say that out of that effort, uh, we have yet to um, you, we have yet to be uh, challenged to do something major that's different from what we are already doing. Um, just quickly uh, on the National Academy of Science meeting, which was a very important meeting, uh, was a, a big public venue. Uh, the leading critics of dual system estimation were invited to make presentations, and there was a lively exchange between the critics and supporters. It was a very important meeting for us. Uh, we took back some bit, bits and pieces of things where we could improve, but again, uh, it did not, uh, it did not, um, it did not challenge the heart of what our, what our design is. 
in any kind of sustained, systematic way that, that led us to sort of say, oh my goodness, we better not be doing what we are doing. I think quite the opposite. We felt uh, reasonably, reasonably confident with what we had put before them. We will have other meetings with the National Academy of Science, with our advisory committees, and so forth. Okay. Thank you. May I ask another question? Okay. <laughs> We're going to do another round, too. Uh, so if you want now or you want to... Let me ask you really quick, because you really went over to. Uh, doc, Dr. Pruitt, uh, last week I introduced legislation which would create a contingency fund of $100 million for the Census 2000. This fund could be assessed if, if, if you ran into any types of serious problems, such as, uh, for example, the male response rate dropped significantly, as you mentioned, or the recruitment rate was, was very low. My, my bill also expands the labor pool for the 2000 Census among certain specific groups including active duty members of the military, those receiving certain federal benefits, and federal retire retirees who have federal buyouts. Um, you, have you had an opportunity to review this legislation? Yes, I have. Uh, I'd like your comments on it, please. Yes, if I could take up first the issue of the uh, re expanding the recruitment pool. Um, we obviously really welcome anything that will expand the recruitment pool, even though, as I've just testified, um, we are on schedule. There is something about a recruitment pool which is uh, which is always soft. You never know when it's going to. You know, uh, tomorrow morning, the phones could quit ringing. We don't expect that to happen, but they could. So we are still in a mode where we are making every every effort to increase the recruitment pool. Uh, I would say, with respect to the, uh, the, the 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 part of the legislation which addresses the waiver issues, that obviously at a certain point it will be too late. Uh, these are the kinds of things we're we're at 1.2 million now. Uh, we, we just simply need all the help we can get you know, this week and next week. So I would urge the Congress, if it can act on, on those issues, to do so expeditiously or it'll simply be past the point where we can uh, much take advantage of it. With respect to the uh, contingency fund, um, as I have said to the, um, in our own response to the GAO report, that obviously, uh, if, and if I just said to the chairman, uh, I might say in the chairman's defense, the reason that his time went over 10 per Ten minutes as I talked about ten minutes mm -hmm. in response to one question. Mm -hmm. um, the um, it, it's hard for us to imagine that if we have a a response rate seriously below sixty one percent that we will be able to complete the census and provide the uh, apportionment numbers on schedule without additional funds. I just don't know what else we could say. Uh, there's nothing else that we can do. Uh, I would say about the specific amount that you've mentioned in your appropriation that the amount is hard to know at this time because a 55% a response rate kicks into place perhaps a different number than the number that you've put there. A 59% response rate, if other things have gone very well, we might not need additional money. We might then have to come back to the U.S. Congress. As you know, we're under a restriction not to move monies across frameworks. We might have to come back and say, look, we might want to move some money across a framework. Uh, in order to, to reach this. So it's hard for me to sit here today for the reasons that I tried to explain in a, a moment ago uh, to specify the amount that we would need because it is so dependent upon the interaction between the response rate and the quality of the, of the uh, recruitment pool at that, at that time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ryan. Hi, Dr. Pruitt. Thanks for uh, coming by. I know you're a busy guy, so we want to let you get back to your job. Um, I just have one quick question I want to ask you. I've toured my local census office twice uh, since they've been up and running. I, I represent the first district of, of Wisconsin, and that would be your Racine office. I think the number is 2546. Uh, and each occasion that I visited with the workers of your local census office, 2546, they've presented me with a problem that they have in recruiting. And it's a letter I wrote to you on January 20th, haven't had a response yet, and that is this. They're not getting their paychecks on time. They've in one instance, they waited six weeks for their last paycheck, uh, the workers at the census office. They're still telling me, I have spoke with them actually two days ago, still not getting their paychecks on time. They believe that this is critical toward not only attracting but maintaining a good workforce. And my concern is that if this is happening all across the country, uh, let alone in our Racine office, and people are being hired but not being paid, not even being paid for six weeks, you know, two days I can understand, but six weeks, that's going to hurt our ability to retain the workforce we need. <clears throat> is this a problem that's occurring across the country? Is this isolated to, uh, you know, local census office 2546 or the Chicago region? Or if this has been a problem, has it been solved? It apparently hasn't been solved 
in my neck of the woods. Um, could you comment on that, please? Um, well, I'm going to, to <clears throat> you have a date on that? Yeah. And when I ask Marvin Raines to join me, if, if, please. if I can. Um, I, I would say in general, uh, Mr. Ryan, that it's almost got to be an isolated problem because if it were across the country, uh, it would be a very, very major crisis that, force uh, at, at this stage. And it's exactly the kind of crisis that I would feel obligated to bring to the committee's attention because it, it's something that could put the census in jeopardy if we're unable to pay our, our employees on, our, on a regular basis. Uh, with respect to that particular office, can we offer I, some? I'm afraid I can't offer right now. I'll have to check in. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're a little surprised. Uh, well, I sent you a letter on January 20th. Uh, this year, uh, almost a month ago, um, I cc'd Stanley Moore, the director of the Chicago office, sent it to you. Um, I'll just read it to you briefly, and then well, I won't please. chew up we much more time. But we're, we think we're in fairly good shape with respect to responding to congressional letters, and honestly, Mr. Ryan, we don't, our system doesn't seem to... Well, I sent you a follow-up letter on January 25 as well, uh, asking for a response no, to the no, first letter. Sure. So I've, I've sent you yeah. two letters. Uh, one on the 20th and one on the 25th. Um, you're at the Bureau of Census, right? <laughs> That's the address I used. <laughs> I know it was Statistics Canada. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Sutton Federal Center, room 2049, building yeah. 3. Uh, oh, no, I, I don't doubt well, your, your address, right? Here's the point. Yep. They're not getting paid at the Racine yep. office. Uh, they're, they've lost some people because they're not getting paid. So it's hurting their ability to attract workers. I hope it's an isolated instant, but if it isn't, please, Please look we'll, into this. We'll, we'll be in touch with your office tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Mr. Davis. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Pruitt, we hear people talking about the difficulty of recruiting. Uh, is, is that just in certain areas, or is it across the board? Well, uh, the, the most important thing to say is that we have met every recruitment goal that we've had, where we've had to have so many people in place for a given operation to date. That is, we had to, uh, we've hired a total of about 160,000 people for our different operations to date, uh, for our address listing work uh, in across the country. That is, certain areas were harder than other areas, but we hired everyone. We had to hire a lot of people for our Alaska work. Uh, of course, all of those were there on time. We have 520 offices. Each of those have four managers. Uh, that's obviously slightly in excess of um, uh, 5,000 or 2,000 persons. All of those have been hired. Um, so none of the operations which hit a, 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 a schedule uh, obligation were we not able to find the number of people we needed. Now, the next big one, as I said, is, is starts on March 3rd with, um, with the... Um, update leave, and I actually provided you a, a table in your document, and you will see that across our 12 regions plus Puerto Rico, uh, that's in attachment A, um, what you have there is the recruiting goal for update leave operation, which is the next one, which is um, a, a quite substantial set of recruiting goals, but in every region save one, we're well above our target. Now, the problem with the newspaper articles is that you've got different operations in different regions. It's a very complex system. You know, when do you need how many people to be doing this operation and that operation? Uh, I don't want to sit here today and promise you we will not have a recruitment problem, but no operation in Census 2000 has not gone forward on schedule because of a recruitment problem. But and you're saying also that the goals are not necessarily the same in every they're place. They're extremely different because they're different by, where you have a large update leave operation, uh, you've got to have a lot of people in your recruitment pool right now because you're going to need them in about three weeks. Non-response follow-up starts April 17th. You actually don't want, because the recruitment pool can also go, go sour. You know, you, you think you've got it all, but by the time they don't, you don't call them back for a month, they say, well, they, they must not want me. I'll go do something else. So there's a, it's an extremely uh, complex set of operations and recruitment strategies you've got going on simultaneously. The big picture I gave you is the accurate one, which is, uh, I think it's as of February 6th, we were running about 5% ahead of our national goal. Let me just ask Not in every region, of course, and not in every local office. Are you hearing anything that's alarming coming from any of the, what we call, hard-to-count 
are most difficult to count communities and population groups? Um, we are not thus far, and again, I, I can only say thus far, we are not hitting particularly complicated pockets, like we can't get enough Hispanic enumerators, uh, or we're not doing very well in the inner cities. Uh, we have, there are, there are always small pockets, but there's no pattern we suggest that we're going to not be able to hire the enumerators from those, from those areas as of now. I was saying to the chairman before the meeting, um, I'm, I'm myself trying to understand where so many of these applicants are coming from. And I just yesterday got some data from the Labor Department. The Labor Department has a, a, a new category in its, um, in, its, in its presentation of the employment status of the civilian population that it's just added. It's persons who currently want a job but who are not in the labor market. That is, they don't meet the test of people who've been actively seeking a job, which is what puts you in the labor market. But this is a new category of people actually who would take a job or interested in a job but haven't yet been actively seeking it. By the estimate from the Labor Department is that totals 4,552,000 people. Uh, nearly as many people as are unemployed. That is, there are a lot of people looking for a job that, uh, and we think we must be getting them. Um, there are about nine million people between the ages of, of 45 or 55 and 65 who are not in the labor market. We are getting them. We're, our total, um, our total, uh, out of our total applicant pool, uh, more than two thirds are women and more than two thirds over 40. So we're getting to some kind of recruitment pool that we didn't expect to, to get to. We, or our last count, we have 70,000 people in our applicant pool who are non-citizens. We did not have that. So we're putting lots of pieces. We want to understand this ourselves. We want to understand why it seems to be going well. Uh, because uh, if it is, we, we're less likely to run into a problem. So we're studying every day what's accounting for the fact that we are running ahead of schedule. I can't, I mean, there may be a particular problem in a particular office in, in Racine that I'm simply not aware of. But I can only tell you that if this were a across-the-board crisis, either for payment reasons or recruitment reasons, I would have to be sharing that with you. I don't want, I don't want to surprise this committee of something of that magnitude. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Uh, we're going to have another round. Um, and uh, Mr. Ryan has to go to another meeting, so we'll let Mr. Ryan, Ryan go first, and then we'll just, all right, Mr. Ryan? I won't belabor the point about our Racine, Wisconsin office, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Pruitt, but I, I would very much sure. appreciate your timely response to that uh, and hope that this isn't occurring in other parts of the country. I'd like to ask Mr. Chairman that some articles be included in the record. Without objection. Um, what these articles indicate, and I, and I was just interested in your testimony where you cite that Boston is, is the only region with a low applicant pool, and I see the chart in your, in your testimony, but a couple days ago, I think it was at your press briefing on the, on the second you said that you were behind in Atlanta and Detroit. In addition, we see a lot of these media accounts that suggest that both the Navajo and Cherokee nations are not applying for census employment at the requisite rate. Um, what's, what, can you reconcile these media reports and your, your discussion at your last press briefing on Detroit and Atlanta with your current testimony of Boston as being the only problem? Um, the, uh, yes, sir, the, the, the comment I made at the press conference the other day about um, Detroit and Atlanta, I believe, was actually based upon a different set of data from the data that we put in attachment A, uh, which is why there's some uh, difference. And indeed, things move very fast. In fact, um, I think it's Atlanta where we, we, where we were behind our, our overall goal, and we move that up by over 5% over the weekend. We have all kinds of things we begin to do when we see that curve starting to slip. We suddenly uh, assign, we, we double or, or increase the number of recruitment assistants that we have in, in place. So we have the capacity to do that. So if somebody's running well ahead of schedule, they're getting less recruitment money, less recruitment advertising, somebody below, they suddenly get more personnel to do the recruiting and more advertising money. So that set of data that I talked about at the press conference is one, it's old data. You know, it's, 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 it's 10 days old data. The data that we put before you today primarily focuses on the update leave because that's our next major operation and I thought that's what you would be most interested in, in, in learning about. Um, the press uh, reports that one can see, the window rock, I looked at the window rock data, for example. Um, by our account, we're way ahead of our target in window rock. 
um, for Update Lee, which is the big operation that we have in, in the Navajo Nation. So I can't, I can't explain that story. Part of what happens is that, um, you know, you, you say, well, we're halfway there. We only need to be halfway there. And the press decides that, my goodness, they're only halfway there. And so that becomes the story. Or sometimes you will have a, um, you know, a local recruiter, somebody who works with the Census Bureau, who says that, uh, you know, who decides to use the press to sort of generate a little anxiety in the community to try to improve the, 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 the applicant uh, rate. So a lot of things are happening in these press stories. Uh, all I can really say is that if we had a national problem right now on the recruitment front, I would have presented to you different testimony. I mean, nothing would be uh, more foolish than for me to come and sound very reasonably optimistic right now about our recruitment efforts, and then to have to come back to you a week from now and say, guess what? It doesn't look like it's going to happen. Uh, that's, I would much rather err on the side of, uh, of, of caution than, than optimism on something as critical as this. So all I can repeat is that nationally, we are ahead of schedule. With respect to our operations, we are already there. That is, the re with respect to the immediate operations, and that certainly includes the Navajo Nation, which is a big update leave uh, area. Um, and so I can't explain that Window Rock press story. Okay, uh, well, I look forward to your answer on our uh, paycheck problem. May, may, but, yeah. may I now correct the record? Um, uh, we have received your letters, and I'm sorry that I, I, I did not know that, but we have received your letters, um, and both the field office and the region are investigating, uh, and that I will have an answer to you by the end of the week, uh, making this very clear exactly what's going on. Um, okay. And I should say that if there were widespread pay problems, we wouldn't be, that word would be getting out. But that, we, that was my concern. Yeah, I mean, we're, I mean, and we're seeing in our office we have you know a six-week delay and it's hurting the recruitment. So I just was concerned that this was happening. Yeah, surely, no, it's, a, it's a and, understandable. Uh, understandable. So, but, so thank you, sir. Great, thank you. Are you back now? And time. not to forget, we we have all these. Uh, you, you've seen all of our mm -hmm. launch books yes. and all of our uh, uh, what 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 did you used to call them? I can't now. Oh, flight schedules. Flight schedules. Yeah, flight schedules. Yeah, right, yeah that's right. That's right. right. Yeah. Well, we're Good. gonna take a look at those a little later. Good. Thanks. Yeah. Miss Maloney. Okay. Um, um, let me bring up a question about um, ACE, just briefly. I know we're, you're working on it. I know there was a meeting last week. You mentioned the Janet Norwood Committee. Um, and I know it's still the process. What is the timeline to have a plan ready for, you know, for, you know, for us to have a hearing? Or at least, I don't want to interfere or have a hearing on it in the middle of the census, of course. Yeah, but I think. The public needs to be aware of it. Oh, certainly. And I, I'm glad the hearing, from what I've heard about last week, that it was a very open discussion and all sides were heard, and that's good. So. Yes. And, and, and I know we have a difference of opinion on that issue. But, uh, well, I, I think we don't have a difference of opinion about the importance of doing an ACE. I, I think we all know that we want to, uh, we want to do the quality check uh, on, on, on the census. There's no other way to do a quality check other than to go back and find out how well you did. And that's what ACE does. Um, I think there's a difference of viewpoint about whether uh, it should be used to adjust the, the data for redistricting purposes, but not the ACE itself. And I think that, uh, that certainly the, uh, the debate in front of the uh, Norwood Committee, uh, which is a quite constructive debate, um, really just focused on that issue, not at all focused upon the fact that, that uh, the Census Bureau should or should not have an ACE and do dual system estimation. I think maybe the most interesting thing that emerged in that discussion, um, which we are prepared to talk about to this committee any time, I mean, I appreciate your sensitivity to where we are, but a somewhat different set of people uh, could put together material for this committee if they would like to have a hearing on ACE. Um, we are well under, we are where we need to be on that schedule as well. We needed to have listed all of our ACE uh, sample blocks. Those are now all fully listed. We're now doing uh, a, a check of the uh, housing, uh, the address work between that and the census file. Uh, so we're we're moving along on schedule with respect to that operation as well. Hiring and opening offices. Are you opening? Oh yeah, that's much further down the line, and that that won't happen until uh, the summer. How many offices so, will be involved? Do you know offhand? The different pr staff. Yeah. We we actually we we run another yeah. We actually run the ACE out of our uh, census offices, not out of our decennial census offices, but our standard regional offices. But you'll be hiring. New st separate staff. Very, very few. Most of the, I, I think maybe 100% of the leaders uh, are are already Census Bureau. They are already doing survey work for the Census Bureau. Because they're much, much more professional interviewers than the army of workers we have to hire 
for, um, for the non-response follow-up. We actually, it's very important that the ACE be done by extremely talented people because you have to get a very, very high response rate. What's the and timeline for ACE? When does that begin? Or? ACE begins in uh, July and we're out of the field in early September. Let, can I, Jay, wait, we'll give you the more. We, actu we actually begin our ACE interviewing on an LCO by LCO basis right after we're sure we're through with non-response follow-up. Because of the independence, we don't want interviewers out there in the blocks trying to do ACE interviewing and then have the census enumerators that are there doing non-response follow-up become aware that their block is one that's being checked so they would work extra hard or maybe not as hard on that. So the, the, uh, as far as the interviewer pool, because of the independence, a number of the interviewers that might have worked, it's possible that people work on non-response follow-up would, would also work on ACE, but they would not work in the same area where they'd worked on non-response follow-up. And once they've gone to do any work on the ACE, they're not able to go back and work on any part of the census because we were trying to make sure we have the independence. On the office, we have an office we call a, an SRO office, which is basically associated with our regional census centers. That's for independent purposes, so that we don't, it's associated with our regional offices, so that they're not, people don't know in the regional offices where these particular blocks are. Associated with each LCO or in the general vicinity of each local census office, there's a small amount of space where supplies are kept and has a separate entrance that people working on the, uh, the individual ACE survey could get, get to, could get materials, but that's physically separate with a separate lock and a separate entrance from the regular LCO. What happens if the uh, male response rate is significantly below 61%? How does that affect ACE? You have to be in the field longer, as you said. It, it would, to the extent that any, in any individual LCO, to the extent that we did not get non-response follow-up done as soon, we would not be able to start ACE as soon. I mean, we, can't, we cannot be out there doing both operations at the same time. Right. But, and, you know, and so I say it's by an LCO by LCO basis. If uh, six weeks into the operation, a particular LCO essentially had their non-response follow-up done, we could begin doing ACE in that LCO. But we wouldn't start in any LCO until the non-response follow-up for that LCO was completed. Yeah, I, I, Dr. Pruitt, I think you know, I, I, I believe we need a, a quality check. I think that's you know expected and appropriate and all that. But, but I do have serious concerns about both the legality and the st statistical validity of adjusted data by census uh, track or census blocks and uh, the adjusted set of numbers, the way they're used. Uh, they're validity, and I think there's a legitimate debate within the statistical community, certainly. and certainly within the legal community, on that issue. And so at some stage, uh, we want to discuss it in more detail. Um, sure. Ms. Maloney. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our country, um, Dr. Pruitt, is experiencing the lowest unemployment levels in, in recent history, with an exceedingly tight labor market, yet you seem to be reaching your recruitment goals, and I'd, I'd like your comments. And you, to further help us understand why you're able to reach them even with this extremely tight labor market. One of the cities or areas that was the most undercounted <coughs> the last time was my own uh, great home state and city of New York. And I just uh, would like to know how the recruitment process is going in New York. Are there any specific problems? And do you know what percentage of your recruitment goals you've reached in New York? Uh, if you don't have that with you, you can get back to me um, later in, in writing. Well, I have, uh, I can certainly give you um, the New York region. Uh, I can't give you right now the New York City, and I can't give you your district. Uh, New York region actually uh, is ahead of target. Uh, it's at about 50% of its overall target for the general operation. And for non-response follow-up, of course, since there are very few in the New York region, where we have no trouble whatsoever staffing up. I mean, I'm sorry, for mailback um, uh, update leave operations, we have no difficulty whatsoever meeting that target. So we'll clearly be doing the New York region operations on schedule when we get them. New York is a difficult, I mean, New York City, of course, is a very difficult city to, to, to count. And uh, and this goes to the issue that, that Mr. Wade just addressed. Uh, we have to make an LCO by LCO decision, and not all LCOs will be finished in 10 weeks. And New York is one of the areas in 1990 where we had to keep the LCOs open somewhat, somewhat longer. Um, one of the important things we've done in 2000 
is to look at the areas which gave us the hardest uh, time in 1990 and compensate for that in our recruitment effort, in our planning, in our uh, supervision, and so forth. So it's not as if we don't know the areas where we, we're going to have the hardest non-response follow-up effort and that we haven't already done what we can to build in, uh, deepen, deepen the capacity uh, for, those, for those areas. Um, nevertheless, these are difficult, these are very difficult areas to count. Uh, thank you. I, I understand that next week, and you mentioned it in your opening uh, statement, that the Bureau will be kicking off a major new promotional effort uh, for the census, census 2000 road tour. And can you give us some, some details? Will there be one of these road tours in New York? Uh, where are these? You said there'll be 10 of them. Can you there'll just be elaborate? There'll one in each region, and uh, each have an independent schedule, uh, and obviously targeted on the hard-to-count areas. Uh, so, yes, there certainly will be one in, in New York. Indeed, uh, without perhaps revealing too much, I can say that the, uh, the kickoff event itself will uh, actually start in downtown New York. Oh, really? Uh, the, big, the big national launch of it will be uh, on national television uh, on, um, in, in, in a, at an event uh, that we have reason to believe will be very widely seen. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, the, the paid advertising campaign is, is now in, in full swing. And I understand it's uh, probably too early to have measured any impact from the campaign, but has there been any oversight done on the campaign now? What sort of evaluation do you plan to do on the ad campaign to see, in fact, if it is uh, working? Well, um, we have a fairly extensive evaluation effort that's underway. We did a baseline survey under contract to uh, uh, NORC at the University of Chicago. Uh, and then we do a midterm evaluation, then we do a follow-up evaluation after the census is over that tries to gauge the impact of the advertising campaign. Uh, we are exploring ways to even deepen that, that evaluation uh, work. Obviously, Young and Rubicon, which is, is represented here today, can also comment on this. They do their own internal uh, work as well, that is the advertising industry actually try to study the impact of ads. I might say that one of our partners um, at, at, at did, a, did a nice thing for us. Um, they did study, uh, they were studying the ad campaign for the Super Bowl, and they included a, a look at the Census Bureau ad, which was mentioned by both of you. Um, and of the people who watched the Census Bureau, 46% uh, uh, were, were able to, they remembered having seen the Census ad. And of those 46, which is a huge number of people, of course. Great. Of those 46%, 44% said it would motivate them to complete the form and the rest said it wouldn't have effect one way or the other because maybe they were already going to complete the form. And no one said that it would act as no one said it would act as a deterrent. Um, and then we asked a third question, or the third question was asked on our behalf uh, by our partner agency. Uh, and that question was, "Are you the person in the household who's most likely to fill in a census form?" And my recollection is about 75% of the respondents were, were was that person. So uh, we felt very good about that. Uh, this this did breakthrough, it did get noticed, and it was motivating. That, that, that's very good news. I, I was watching uh, television around the Super Bowl, and they started rating the ads from the last Super Bowl. So it'll be interesting if our census ad uh, is up there at the top or wins the prize for having had the most impact on the press. Well, it, it, uh, I people. want to say on behalf of Young and Rubicam uh, that uh, they were up, they had obviously not designed that ad to be on the Super Bowl. That was <laughs> a, a uh, b because it was, it was it turned out to be a very, um, not as expensive to, to get that ad placement as, as it might have otherwise have been because of the time it was chosen. And also, um, they were up against some very tough competition. That is, you're <laughs> up against people who are, are spending millions and millions of dollars just to design the ad just for the Super Bowl. <laughs> so there was a little hesitancy about, uh, about the uh, competitive environment for, for the ad. But nevertheless, the decision was it was worthwhile uh, making the effort, of course, on behalf of the census. And uh, we were all pleased. Uh, at the initial uh, response that have come back in from the agency, uh, from the advertising uh, research, which does suggest it more than held its own, as in terms of the quality of the ad itself. Well, how many ads will the average American see? And will people in undercounted, traditionally undercounted neighborhoods see more ads than uh, yes. an our, our uh, area that may is, be overcounted? Yes, our estimate is, Young and Rubicom's estimate is that the typical media consumer in the African-American population, the hard to reach African-American population, will receive about 122 impressions. That's television, radio, uh, out of print, and so forth. 122 different impressions 
uh, and the typical Hispanic uh, media consumer will, I think the number is 105 impressions. Um, most of us will probably see in the neighborhood of 20 impressions uh, because we're simply not the consumers of the targeted media that is going after the hard to count. So there's a huge difference between, uh, and so I, I mention that because if you don't see a whole lot of advertising, you may not think a whole lot is out there, but it may well be your, your media consumption habits. The time is up, thank you. Yeah, it was the ad that was used was, I think, maybe one of our favorites of the ones we saw, but uh, that's tough competition to run ads on Super Bowl yes, because it's some of the, uh, that's the Super Bowl of advertising, at least in my opinion. And <laughs> you see the herding of cats and the dog that, uh, for the Budweiser, that crashed into the uh, van and all. You, uh, but, uh, but actually, that was one of the cuter ones, so it was uh, good to see that one. So uh, uh, I'm glad that we have a degree of optimism at this stage. I look forward, I think we're going to have another hearing on the 8th, early in March, to kind of have the status of the update, and I appreciate that. Um, I, mean, I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses' written state opening statements be included in the record. Without objection, so ordered. May, may I add, uh, our time is up, may I add yes. a few more mm -hmm. questions, just because I just want to, I don't get this yeah. opportunity often, and I want to find out from Dr. Pruitt how it's going. Um, it sounds like the paid ad campaign is doing very well. Could you inform us about the public service announcements? And are you meeting your goals? Has the uh, paid advertising campaign helped increase leverage for the placement of public service ads uh, with the networks? And uh, if I recall in 1990, we relied totally on, on pro bono and public service. And if you could uh, sure. give us an overview. Just, just quickly on that, um, the, uh, the total of uh, uh, dollar amount of value added advertisement is already $8.7 million. That is, our ad campaign has been increased by 8.5 percent just, just on value added. The uh, pro bono work, I just, just before we came to this hearing, uh, we had a marvelous um, uh, 15 or 20 minutes with Young and Rubicon, uh, where they were showing us the rough cut of three new ads that are pro bono ads, public service ads. They feature uh, Ivan Rodriguez, uh, Barry Bonds and Derek Jeter. Uh, that is a geographic spread, ethnic spread, of course, of these three very, very uh, uh, key baseball players uh, in very high quality ads delivering the confidentiality message. Uh, we already know that those ads will be used in the um, um, public service announcement space of NBC. Uh, and we think other, we're fairly certain other networks is going to be shown, for example, Am I saying more than I should be saying? No. Oh, okay. Here I, I just don't know what's, I don't know what's public record yet. Uh, it will be shown during the NBA finals, for example. Um, and uh, they will all be shown on the opening day of baseball season, which of course is, is a, a very big media event. And it's still early enough to try to have a little bump, even though we're in early April by then. Uh, these are very creative ads, very powerful ads. Uh, we think they are such good ads uh, that they're likely to be used disproportionately as public service ads because they're so attractive. Um, Mr. The chairman has informed me that he has a conflict. He has oh. to be at another hearing. I have about five more yeah. questions I wanted to cover. May I submit yes. them to you in Please. writing? And if you would respond, sure. we appreciate it. Sure. All right. In fact, uh, I think it was flying up here the day after the Super Bowl, and the USA Today, I was reading, had a, actually a ratings of all the ads on Super Bowl Sunday, and we were right in the center. I tell yeah, you, we we, did all right. when you were that competition, <laughs> well, <laughs> we sure you were in the bottom ten when they listed also. <laughs> That's right. But we don't herd cats, but at times you think you may be herding cats. <laughs> in case there are any additional questions uh, that members may have for our witnesses, I ask unanimous consent for the record to remain open for two weeks for members to submit questions for the record and that Dr. Pruitt, Pruitt submit written answers as soon as practicable. Without objection, so ordered. I have to run to another hearing. Thank, Thank you very much for being you. here and good luck. Sure. Meeting adjourned.
Next, Federal Communications Chairman William Kennard. At about 2.25, Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt on his department.